What is going on, everybody? It's the Fox, and we're here for a SmackDown review for June the 5th, 2020. We are a week and two days away from Backlash, where it's supposed to have the greatest wrestling match ever between Edge and Randy Orton, which is going to be a total failure. Braun Strowman, of course, put his title on the line against both Miz and Morrison in a handicap match. What does WWE do after Bray Wyatt? Where do we go from Bray Wyatt versus Braun Strowman? What is that next match going to be? A handicap match against two men who win the tag team division. I know Bray Wyatt just had his second child with JoJo. Congratulations to them. I would have rather Braun Strowman take the month off than the shit we saw tonight. Tonight. First off, whoever does the editing or whatever should realize that it's, it's not that time of the year where it's like 8 o'clock and it's pitch black out. Because I'm sitting here watching SmackDown and it was like 8.27 when The Miz and Morris' first segment came on. And it's not dark out here. It's starting to get dark, but it wasn't dark out here. I know they're in Florida, but I'm in the same, I am in the east, the um, same time zone as Florida. So it's not going to be pitch black down there when it's staying like that up here. It just isn't going to happen. But that's nothing here, 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 there, there. WWE. I don't know if it was Bruce Pritchard with the I love you. Or Vince McMahon, damn it. Who pitched this bullshit idea. Miz and Morrison are out in a white van. Wearing goofy glasses that say hey, hey, ho, ho on them. Cameras everywhere. They have they're hooked up to different surveillance surveillance centers in the surveillance cameras in WWE's PC. They wait for Braun Strowman to show up in this beautiful black. I don't know what they called it. It was a black car. I'm not good with car. Um, what cars are which? It looked like a cattle after me or one of those things. I don't know. It was a black car. It was a really nice classic one. They wanted to make. They said two weeks ago they're going to make Braun Strowman's life a living hell. So, we go to another segment, and Braun Strowman is in the PC. He's getting his protein shake. He's getting ready to, you know, get, have some protein for himself to go, you know, maybe work out a little bit because they still have a weight room that they're not using right now. And he could probably, you know, lift some weights, get himself stretched and ready for his match at Backlash. It explodes in his face. Okay, ha ha ha, funny, funny, funny. To a fucking five-year-olds. Then... We come to later in the show. He's being interviewed by Caleb Braxton. They hit a button. I thought we were watching Nickelodeon Gas or Nickelodeon um, Hijinx, some kind of Nickelodeon TV show, because it wasn't on Braun Strowman. Above Caleb Braxton, down comes Green Slime. And Caleb Braxton got completely covered in slime. Braun Strowman got a little bit on him. He called them bastards. And she walked off and Braun Strowman wasn't happy. Then we go to outside later on. Miz and Morrison are walking to the nice, classically good car. Something that Braun Strowman apparently worked up to save to get it because it looks like one of those cars that would cost a fortune. They take, Miz takes a golf club to it. And then Morrison takes a bat to the windshield. They blow out the windshield. They leave. And the final part of this entire bullshit that we saw... Braun Strowman comes out, has this look of, I am fucking gonna kill whoever messed with my car on his face, goes to look for him in a, and finds the white van, ends up tipping it over. Clearly, it didn't even look like Miz and Morrison were actually in the white van because when it's tipping over, we're flashing from outside the van to inside the van, and they're not moving as if, like, the van, like, where they're at is not moving with. Ron Strowman pushing the van over. So clearly, either this is a like a roll, a roll cage that we have for a van, or they were somewhere else and they were supposed to fall to make it look like they were in a van. This is the best you have for this feud. Ron Strowman is your universal champion. 2018, 2017, maybe even 2016 at the end of that year. Braun Strowman tipping over shit was cool, was good, it was fun. Braun Strowman of 2017-2018 would destroy the Braun Strowman who is Universal Champion right now. 
the Braun Strowman of 2016, 17, 18 would beat this guy up. That guy we could take seriously as a universal champion because he hadn't been destroyed yet. This guy, how are we supposed to take him seriously? This is the best they have for him? You go from psychological warfare with Bray Wyatt to Nickelodeon hijinks and punked and swerved and any other fucking prank show you can think of. This is what you do with these guys. Miz, who is a former WWE champion in his own right, former tag team champions between these two, multiple time intercontinental championships between these two, and this is what you have them lowered to? Blowing up, like, blowing up a protein shake, dropping slime on people, busting up a car. I mean, the car is fine. But that's the only thing they did. They walked out and walked over and destroyed his car. That is fine. That's, uh, that, that's happened before with other, other people. Which, by the way, WWE, I don't know how much they have to pay or how much they have to rent one of these cars to destroy or buy because... They go through a car at least once or twice a year, and those cars are not cheap unless they're getting some of those rejects. But, my god, this was cringe after cringe after cringe after cringe. That was a bulk of the show tonight. Now, the show opened up after they run through the card. We see what happened last week with Elias and the supposed car accident that had to do with Jeff Hardy. And when you watch the video clip back, and I didn't pay attention last week to it, but when you watch the video clip back this week, and I've been a part of a fake act. I, 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 when, you're in, when you're in school around here, in high school, when I was going um, to school, they would do a mock accident where they would have a car tipped over, people covered in fake blood, and, and, um, and, and reenacting what would happen if you rolled your car and people were possibly dying or dead. And the car would be damaged as fuck. This car, if you watch this video back last week, the car doesn't even have a scratch on it. The car looks like they had whoever, whoever staged this, because it looks like an absolute stage. They rolled the car up to the pole, popped the hood up, left the door open, and then had Elias lay down and roll around as if he got hit by the car. It looks so funny, phony on second watch. So phony. Yes, I know it's a work. Yes, I know it's all part of the show. But you can't just, like, I don't care if you don't want to damage the car. I mean, hell, you had Miz and Morrison destroy the car tonight on windshield. You at least could have made it look like the fucking car hit the damn post or did something. That car didn't have a fucking scratch on it. After it was over, they could have put the fucking hood back down. Had somebody back it up and drive it off, and you wouldn't even notice it was in a quote unquote accident. Jack Hardy comes out. He wants to tell his side of the story. He got to the PC last week. You know, he's excited. He was in the ta he's in IC turn t title tournament. Could go on to, be to the finals next, uh, next week. But of course, he gets out, gets his bag, and wham! It's like he got hit with a bunch of bricks. The next thing he remembers, the police. Are grabbing him, arresting him. He smelled like booze. He was getting cut it off. He goes to the police station. He has every sobriety test that they can think of, which I don't know. I've never been to one, but I've only ever seen on anyone take the breathalyzer, you know, stand there, you know, walk a straight line, touch your fingers and stuff, recite all that stuff. But he's passing left and right, and then witnesses come in. And witnesses say that they saw the man who did it, and the man who did it had red hair and a red beard. Clearly not Jeff Hardy. So he eventually was released. He couldn't get back here soon enough, conveniently towards the end of the show, mind you. And he's pissed off because Seamus was trying to take everything away from him, and he's gonna be, and I, he said, I'll be damned if I, let you do, if I let you get away with it. So, of course, of course it was going to be a setup. There's like, uh, first off, I think it's pathetic. I think it's disgusting to even use Jeff Hardy's real life demons to have some kind of story. This guy's supposed to be on a redemption tour. He's supposed to be redeeming himself after everything he's been through. All the heartbreaks, all the setbacks, all the, all the DUIs, all the drug um, paraphernalia um, arrest and everything. This is supposed to be Jeff Hardy getting on his comeback. And this is what you have for him. Give me a fucking break. Yes, Jeff Hardy has had his demons, but you don't need to exploit it as you do. This is just pathetic. 
he could do a lot better. There's so many other things they could have did, but no, let's do this. So of course, Seamus comes out. And he's like, he, he pretty much denies that I, I didn't do anything. You, you just don't want to do the right thing. You don't want to be a man and own up to your mistakes, own up to your actions. You're not a man. You're a junkie. Do we need him to actually remind him of that? No, we do not. But this is WWE. Do they fucking care? We have to talk about when it comes to this, um, this Sunday about WWE and the talent that were around the ring as quote unquote fans and how WWE treated them. The last week, on the, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We'll talk about that on Sunday. But this is just so dumb. It was so bad. Then, of course, he's like, oh, well, don't worry about your, your, your wife and daughters being disappointed with you. They're used to it. Jeff gets out of the ring. He goes up there. They brawl for a little bit. Bro kick. Take, takes on Jeff Hardy. Thrown into the barricade a couple times. And that was that. This match will be happening at Backlash that was announced later in the show. So Jeff Hardy will get his hands on Sheamus again, but this time at Backlash and not on the pre-show as far as I've seen. Now, Otis. So we go to the back after this is all said and done. We see Otis and Mandy Rose. They're walking, they're talking, they're flirting with each other. They're being all WW and whatnot. When Otis noticed... Baron Corbin's throne, his cape, his crown. Hands Mandy the briefcase and is like, oh, well, look, my peach, this is pointy, but let me try this thing on. He takes the crown, puts it on. She says it looks good on him. They walk away and head to the ring. We go back to the ringside area. Corey Graves and Michael Cole get a one or two words in, and then Baron Corbin, we see, come up to his throne. He's like, where's my crown? Where's my crown? He's going ballistic. Where the... My crown, he's like, just the guy, the, the bum over here snitches out fucking Otis. He's like, yeah, it was Otis. He took it. Baron Corbin's not happy. He heads to the ring. We have Baron Corbin versus Otis. Is our first match of the night. Uh, Baron Corbin needs to stop wrestling. Baron Corbin sucks. And where's Tucker? Is Tucker injured? Did Tucker get injured to the point where he can't compete? I know this Otis and Mandy storyline is going on, but where the fuck is Tucker. Is WWE silently breaking up heavy machinery? Are we down one extra tag team and WWE is just going to have Otis be on his own until Mandy Rose, sc Mandy Rose screws him over? Because you know it's coming. There's no, absolutely no way Otis comes out of this Mandy Rose and whatever storyline um, uh, uh, and when it comes to this conclusion with Mandy Rose by his side. She's going to turn on him. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's just how it's going to happen. But not that bad not, not that bad of a match, but Otis did all he could to work with Baron Corbin. And match comes to an end with Baron when Otis has Baron Corbin down. He goes for the caterpillar. Um Baron Corbin leaves the ring, he goes over the ringside area, he's like, give me my crown, give me my crown. They give him his crown. But Otis comes over, he flops Otis and he mooshes Otis in the in the throat, grabs a chair, hits him in the stomach, goes to hit him again. It's not affecting Otis as much as it sh probably could be. He throws Otis back in the ring. He goes to attack him with the chair again. Otis stops that, hits the caterpillar. That was that as Otis and Mandy say, uh, Otis and Mandy celebrate a DQ victory. Already talked about the um, Miz and Morrison shit. I don't give a fuck. Lacey Evans versus Sonya Deville. Lacey Evans comes down. She gets attacked from behind at the beginning before the match even starts. We come back and Sonya Deville and her have a match. Now, I remember when the first words, apart, the first report came out, the first rumor came out that they were going to split up Fire and Desire. And most podcasts that I could listen to or I listened to talked about how so this is like if this happens and they break up, Sonya Deville is DOA. She's dead in the water. She's going to go nowhere. She's going to be done. They're not going to do a thing with her. And it just felt like that Mandy Rose is going to be the one they're going to push because look at her. She's hot. She's got blonde hair. That's a, that's a double whammy for Vince McMahon. He's probably creaming in his jeans every time he sees her. And it felt like there, it just always seemed like Man, that Sonya Deville was going to be left out on the lurch. She was going to be the Marty Jannetty. She was going to be somebody that nobody was going to see. She was going to be catering. 
just wrestling and being a job to the stars. But then we see from the moment they split these two up to now, everything Sony Deville has done has been fantastic. She has been cutting great promos. She has become intense in the ring. She has improved so exponentially. Lacey Evans has still got some, has still got room to grow. I mean, the only thing that I actually like that Lacey Evans does is that fucking moonsault, the twisting moonsault, where she jumps, where she's standing one way, twisted around, and does a moonsault. Ten times, a hundred times better than what Charlotte Flair does as a moonsault. And that's got to be sad to somebody. But in the match, halfway through the match, I believe it was Sony inadvertently thrown into the referee. Referee goes down. He's like calling for help, calling for help. He's like stop, guys, stop, guys. He's calling for help. I don't know if he if he was legitimately hurt. That sucks. They could have cut the commercial break and then had Michael Cole dub in because this was last week that they taped this last Tuesday. Could have dubbed in that during the commercial break. They could have showed a replay, whatever. That the referee went down. That's why we have another referee, which Jessica Carr has lost her name. She's just another referee now, which that fucking sucks. But Sonya Deville is dominating this match. Looks like she's going to put Lacey away when all you hear is, Hey, Sonya! Hey, Sonya, up here! Sonya! And Manny Rose is all in the Titan Tron. Manny Rose has figured, said, I figured it out. You're jealous because you're never going to be a... You're not a fighter. You're a failure. This pisses Sonya Deville off. She's like, you want to come say that to my face? Gets so hot, so heated. When Lacey Evans turns it around, she doesn't see the woman's right coming. One, two, three. Lacey Evans beats Sonya Deville. Clearly, Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose's beef is not over. I don't know if Otis and Dolph Ziggler's beef is still is over yet, but we haven't seen anything between those two since Otis, uh, since many since Sonya Deville and Dolph Ziggler won their match, and then he took Otis out afterwards. But obviously, it looks like Mandy Rose. And Sonya Deville are far from over. But again, Sonya Deville is showing that if they wanted to give this woman a championship opportunity, I could see them running with her after Bailey loses the championship to Sasha Banks. I could see Sasha Banks and Sonya Deville having a feud. Once, Sonya, once Sasha Banks turns babyface, Sonya Deville and Aunt Sasha Banks having a feud for the women's championship and Sonya Deville coming out on top as your women's champion for... for However long they want to go. Maybe Royal Rumble to WrestleMania. I think that would be fantastic for her. The whole Australian thing we already did. Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles come face to face. I can't justify what Daniel Bryan says. This guy is just amazing. They come out here. They both talk. Daniel Bryan wants... Daniel Bryan... Pretty much the gist of it is... Is that... Daniel Bryan wants to bring prestige back to the Intercontinental title... By facing everybody. Anybody, whether it's a legend, whether it's a multi-decorated champion, or somebody new who has a chance to break out and possibly one day be a champion. AJ Styles, of course, doesn't, like, Daniel Bryan calls it an opportunity. Daniel, um, AJ Styles calls it a handout. He doesn't believe in handouts. He uh, believes in earning an opportunity, which is kind of contradiction to what happened last week because he had a chance to earn his way into the finals and he took the easy way out which he took a hand out kind of hypocritical of AJ but you know I do see like I do notice something in this promo if you go back and watch it it just felt like Daniel Bryan came off legit came off as sincere came off as somebody who was out there cutting a promo from the heart AJ Styles can it sounded like for the most part he was reading from a script i don't know what it is i don't know if it's aj but it just doesn't feel like aj styles is got the free reign that daniel bryan does i could be wrong but honestly daniel bryan has made the intercontinental title mean more just in the just in his promo against after he beat drew gulak if i believe he had a promo after that and his promo tonight, he's made the Intercontinental title more important than anything they did with Sami Zayn, Braun Strowman, Shinsuke Nakamura, and Finn Balor, who were the last few Intercontinental champions that we've had. This match was pre-taped last week. This coming Tuesday is going to be, uh, this coming Monday is going to be the next set of tapings from Raw, SmackDown, 
NXT on um, Raw SmackDown the 205 Live at Main Event. Which, by the way, if you're watching this episode of SmackDown, you're wondering why does nobody sound enthused? Why does nobody sound? Why does everyone sound tired? Why aren't they as loud as they probably were on Monday night? Because Raw, well, it's because Main Event and 205 Live are the first thing they taped. Then they taped Monday Night Raw because it happened on Monday. Then they taped SmackDown towards the end of the night. So if you're wondering why everyone seems like they're maybe a little tired and a little exhausted, it's because they would they had to go through. 205 Live main event and three hours of Monday Night Raw before they got to SmackDown. So we got the whole Miz and Morrison thing. We went through that already. New Day in Chad Gable, which early in the night, Chad Gable was being interviewed by, I believe it was Kayla Braxton before she got slimed. Mojo Rowley, of all people. Mojo Rowley, who we haven't seen since WrestleMania when he lost the 24-7 I-95 European Whatever, 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 championship to his best friend, Rob Gronkowski. That was the last time we saw him. He comes in here, makes a short joke about Chad Gable, Nakamura and Cesaro show up, they beat the hell out of him till the New Day come in, and then, whoa, surprise, we have the New Day and Chad Gable versus Nakamura, Cesaro, and Mojo Rowley. I didn't give a shit about this match. I didn't. They threw it. They threw it together half-assed at the last minute. So why should I care about it? The only thing that I'm going to take away from this is that every single time, and I don't know how many times we have to hear this, Mojo Rally has a mini push, and then goes away for a while because WWE loses. Vince McMahon loses interest in him, and then he comes back and has a match. What is the one dialogue spot that we hear every fucking time this happens? Gee, what does Mojo Raleigh bring to the table, Graves? Gee, what does Mojo Raleigh bring to the table, Cole? Gee, what does Mojo Raleigh bring to the table, Tom? Every fucking time. It has been three or four years since Mojo Raleigh has been on the main roster. Obviously, he brings nothing to the main roster. He brings nothing to the table because if he brought something to the table, they would have found something to do with him. I have never ever ever even in nxt better fan of mojo rally i think he's all hype and that's it no sizzle no si all sizzle no steak this guy is a waste of fucking time i don't want to see anybody lose their job but i am surprised when april 15th came around and they had that black wednesday his name wasn't on that list because honestly the only reason he should have been singing his praises for a while is because his buddy Gronk was in WWE. Now that his buddy Gronk is officially out of the WWE contract and going back to play for Tampa Bay, what is he going to do? Nothing. He brings nothing to the table. He has never brought anything to the table. The only thing that Mojo Rowley ever did that was worth a damn was being the second best, play, the be the second best um, member of the Hype Bros, being carried by um, Zack Ryder on Zack Ryder's back for the six or seven or eight months that they had that going on. I have never and will never be a fan of this lump of garbage known as Mojo Rowley. And clearly, Vince McMahon isn't a, a full fan of him because he goes, oh, well, we'll give Mojo Rowley something for two weeks, and then boom, we're done with him. We gave him his two weeks. He did nothing for those two weeks. Time to move on again until something else comes up. Gable on the New Day win. I could care less about this match. Mojo did nothing. Cesaro and Nakamura did everything they could to help this out. Gable is highly underutilized. Michael Cole did mention something about him being a great technical wrestler. Why can't he be portrayed as that? Why does he have to have this short gimmick? Why does Mojo... I'm sorry. Why does Chad Gable have to have this short gimmick where he has to be proud to be short? That's fine. He wants to be proud to be short. That's fine. But he needs to embrace... Who he is, and that is a former Olympic athlete. He could be the modern day Kurt Angle, a badass in the ring who can also do comedic spots, a wrestling machine who can also be laugh at himself. Why does it have to be short jokes? Daniel Bryan's not much taller than Dan G Chad Gable, but you don't see him being called Shorty D. Why is Chad Gable forced to do this gimmick? Oh, is it because if he said if he turned down this gimmick, he would probably have been dropped out and probably would have been in part of that April 15th deadline, which honestly would have been better for him. 
because he could have went to AEW or even Impact Wrestling, given whatever name he wanted to use, whether it's his real name or another name, and was able to be better than where he is now in WWE. Chad Gable, the name Chad Gable, has the ability to be a champion of any caliber, whether it's Universal, WWE, United States, or Intercontinental, or even Tag Team. Shorty G, 24-7 garbage, and that is it. Get this guy's actual name back. He actually tweeted out last week, happy to be back, or something like that. And so many people tweeted, get your name back. Nobody. And I repeat, nobody. But Vince McMahon himself likes this fucking name. I guarantee you, Chad Gable goes to sleep at night wishing he didn't have to put up with this garbage. It only does because he knows he gets paid to. He gets paid to. I'm sure if he had a choice, he'd probably be counting down the days until his contract comes up. Then, the main event. Sasha Banks and Bailey, the boss and thug connection. Because it's thug, not hugs, because he doesn't hug anymore. But the boss and thug connection, because I can say that. Take on the tag team champions of Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss. Now, with the fact that Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss over the last few weeks have been feuding with the Moronics over on Raw, I so I so I so thought that they were going to get because and by the way, I think WWE's already dropped the brand the brand invitation because I haven't heard it in two weeks. I haven't heard that since Baron Corbin's failure on Raw, and then Charlotte's failure on SmackDown two weeks in a row. Where is that brand the brand at? What happened to that? That just kind of just went away. But anyway, I wholeheartedly thought that this match was going to get ruined. This match was going to go to a double disqualification or a no contest. And then a backlash to have Boston Thug versus More Rollins versus Bliss Cross Applesauce. That did not happen. Thankfully, that did not happen. One of the biggest takeaways of this match is that one, Bailey and Sasha Banks win the match by the same way, in a sense, that Sasha Banks won the NXT Women's Championship by putting Nikki Cross in a crucifix pin. Two, towards the end of the match, Sasha Banks unknowingly was tagged out, like Bailey tagged in unknowingly to Sasha Banks. Sasha Banks had the Bank statement on Nikki Cross. Bailey goes over, pulls her off, puts her in her own shitty version of the bank statement, telling Sasha Banks to get out. Sasha has this look of what the fuck on her face. I had this match won and you're gonna try and steal it from me, huh? What the fuck was that? That's what she had a look on her face. Now, of course, Nikki gets out of that, and both women are down. Banks goes and grabs. Bailey drags her back over, tags her in, tags herself in, tries to fight for another bank statement, and Nikki Cross gets out of that, rolls her up into a two. While but Nikki, but while she was in the bank statement, Bailey uh, Alexa Bliss tries to come in. Bailey pulls her back, keeping her out. Nikki rolls her up for a two, but then Banks pulls over and pulls her into the crucifix pin for the one, two, three. Bailey and Sasha Banks are your women's tag team champions. Now. As I said before, what does this do for that entire three weeks so period they had the Billy Kay, Peyton Royce versus Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss feud going on? What happens with that? Do I use, do, do I want to see anything done with them? No, because the Moronics are terrible. Maybe Billy Kay, Peyton Royce, what they did, um, having that terrible match this past week, I think it was Billy Kay. Just was like, eh, they're, they're not good enough. We're going to go back to doing this. I don't have a clue, but we have new tag team champions. Now, I want them to take those tag team titles, get the nice little, um, what is it called? Get the nice, um, uh, what are those things called? Barrel, like metal barrel. Put some lighter fluid in there. Put some papers and stuff in there. Put some lighter fluid in there. Some wood maybe too. Put some more lighter fluid in there. Take a match. Late the match. Drop it in there. And then take those women's tag team titles. And drop them to the fire pit. And burn them. Because they're worthless. They're useless. 
and there's nothing we can do about it. There's only three tag teams on the entirety of Raw and SmackDown. Yes, they should go to NXT too because you could have um, somebody else, but you have two. Okay, you have four tag teams if you want to count Kyrie Stan and Oscar, even though I don't think they're even teaming up anymore. But you have Kyrie Stan and Oscar, the Moronics, Bliss and Cross, and Mick and Bailey and Sasha Banks. That's it. That's not a fucking division. You need at least eight to ten tag teams for a career division. Oh, but Raw and SmackDown, Raw men's tag team divisions don't have that many. That's why their tag team divisions are terrible. Do you see what Monday Night Raw is doing with the Raw Tag Team Championships? They got no thing else for these to do. So you have the Viking Raiders and the Street Profits doing carnival games to pass the time before they have a tag team title match. This show was just bleh. Just bleh. The only thing that I enjoyed up until, like, the only thing I can say is that AJ Styles, I forgot to mention that, AJ Styles and Drew Gulak, I skipped over that match. That was a good match. That was a really good match. AJ Styles went out there, of course, in his, like, promo with Daniel Bryan, he wanted to give Drew Gulak an opportunity because he wondered, how did Drew Gulak become Daniel Bryan's coach because he called it a handout. So he's like, fine, I'll give him a quote-unquote handout, um, I mean, quote-unquote opportunity, which I think is a handout. And they had themselves a one hell of a match. Do I wish they could have went a little bit longer? Yes. AJ Styles winning? No. Google actually picks up the surprise win, and AJ Styles has the regroup going into next week's match. That is a big thing about this. Does it hurt AJ in the end? No. Because AJ is AJ. He's Teflon. He's like, he didn't get squashed. He didn't get like, he didn't, he got, he, he lost due to just, oh, he was overconfident thinking, oh, I got this in the bag. It's only Drew Gulak. I'm going to be able to kick his ass. No problem. But <sighs> that is, that is just what it is. We cannot wait to see what happens next week. That's going, that better be the main event of next week's show. And they should be building up all of next week's show. I don't even care what happens on the rest of the show next week. The entire show next week should be AJ Styles, Daniel Bryan, building up to this match. Giving us highlights of, like, the, of the tournament, how they got here and everything. We know it won't be that much. You can show us what happened the last time these guys had a match. Because they, they flipped the script. Last time, Bryan was the heel and, Daniel, and um, AJ was the face. Last time it was for the WWE Championship. Show what happened the last time these two were great, had a great match. I heard it was a fucking fantastic match. I cannot wait to see what happens. But we will have to wait and see what happens going leading up to next week. We are two days away from NXT TakeOver in your house. I will not be reviewing it. I haven't really been watching NXT lately, so I don't think it'll be fair. I will be watching it just because... I want to see what's going on with it. NXT, I'm really disappointed in NXT lately because we're seeing way too much WWE main roster on an NXT show. I don't want to watch, and, and the reason I haven't really been watching NXT is because, or reviewing is because it's feeling more like Raw and SmackDown. And I don't watch NXT to feel like Raw and SmackDown. I watch NXT to feel like NXT. But that is your SmackDown Live review. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. Find me on Twitter at the France Club. Find me on twitch.tv slash the France Club. And I'll see you guys Sunday for Unscripted. We have a lot, and I mean a lot, to talk about when it comes to um when it comes to WWE's treatment of their own PC and NXT talent when they came to the crowd. And oh boy. Is it fucking pathetic, inhumane, and something that WWE should be ashamed of themselves? But until then, my name is The Frogs, and I'll see you guys later.